Unlike the other two subjects talked about detailing the history and use of ex-Soviet object and system, the Paro IFF system is in a delicate state where information is attainable but is not all present on the internet and is very hard to come by usually. Which is why this subject is a bit shorter and more condensed compared to the other ones, sadly. Most of the information on the system comes from aircraft manuals equipped with and tasked with operating the system directly. There is no over-intensive document detailing every detail about it compared to the Silicon 2 system through the apparatuses SRO2 and SRZ02. However, what can be known is still very fascinating, so I hope you all will enjoy. The Parallel IFF system, known as SRO-1P, designated as Product 6201, 6201R, and 6202R1, had begun development a little bit after the implementation of the Silicon 2M system, being the SRO-2M and SRZ-02M within the Soviet Air Forces. As the next step in the evolution of the Soviet IFF and how it was given within its airspace would see the development of the Parallel IFF system. The development of this new IFF upgrade was to still be close to five years away from completion when the Soviet Air Force's ministries wanted it by the time it was requested, which was most likely requested to be completed sooner due to the fact that at the time, recent aircraft defections containing the Silicon 2M system and anxiety-inducing panic frenzy would most likely stem from Balenko and his MiG-25P defection as well as many others not documented or documented being the root cause of this. However, American intelligence agencies actually never got to the IFF equipment on board that MiG-25P. The higher management of the Soviet Air Forces for both the VVS and PVO insisted on the OKB branch responsible for its production, research, and development of Soviet IFF to hasten the development of the Peril IFF system. Thus, the SRO-1P IFF system, known as Peril, would be finished in 1977 and would begin deployment in January of 1978 and is still in service with the Russian Air Force and a few other nations to this day. The SRO-2P product 6202 was the follow-up IFF upgrade for the Peril IFF system and is still in wide use with the RUAF having access to it. In 1995, the Ministry of Defense would issue an order stating that the radar wayband range present in the Silicon 2M, radar wayband 3, that was acceptable in use with the Peril IFF system will now not be used in identifying objects and only be used as an additional or auxiliary channel through controlling airspace. What that means is Silicon 2 would now see no more use in the military but would instead see action in the realm of the Russian civil aviation sphere. This was mandated to most likely reduce confusion with Russian pilots dealing with civilian aircraft and streamline the systems used for military on military interactions. Most IFF equipment on Russian civilian aircraft is nearly an identical copy of the Silicon 2 system designated as Product 020. This new IFF system would see deployment within many aircraft the VBS and PBO operated once it came out, but would still take many years to fully outfit the entire Air Force with the updated system. As per usual Soviet fashion, aligned member states would be excluded from the option of purchasing the Peril system for many years until the 1980s or late 1980s, and even then the Soviet Union was still very picky about who got it. The Czechs were about to get them for their MiG-29As, but that deal fell through when Czechoslovakia began to see political reforms. Nations who were given the ability to purchase the parallel system were very rare and most of the time were only considered for nations with extreme tactical importance for the Soviet Union. Such as Ukraine, which housed many important Soviet aircraft installations and held a strategic buffer zone from the west. However, more often what happened was rather than purchasing it, the peril system was inherited by these nations after the Soviet Union's breakup. Another important state member, for instance, was Bulgaria and their MiG-23 MLDs. The Peril IFF system would mainly be installed in the newer aircraft being made by the Soviet Union from the various aircraft manufacturing companies. Main examples include, but are not limited to, the MiG-29, MiG-31, SU-25, SU-27, and TU-160, and of course, many more. Although it was mainly installed in new aircraft, current aircraft being manufactured and fielded at the time also saw these upgrades. Most of the time, though, other aircraft were given what was on hand at the time, being the Silicon 2 or Silicon 2M system. The Peril IFF system, if you couldn't tell, was given primarily activation by the top of the line in newest aircraft, while the others were on a second-hand list in simple terms. 
Of course, the overall goal was to have every Soviet aircraft flying at the time to operate the parallel IFF system, but that task would take well over 10 years, and that was even after with the removal of single-engine fighters such as the MiG-21 and MiG-23 from active service. Even then, they never quite met their goal. It was only after a few years after the Soviet Union's collapse did it actually finally meet their goal. However, this was the point when the Soviet aircraft made before the 1980s were removed from service. Removal of the Silicon 2M system would be conducted when aircraft were sent in for major repairs and done by specialist teams. Since it was going to take over 10 years to outfit the branches of the Soviet Air Forces with the new IFS system, it was seen fit to make the new systems compatible with the old one, which is the main reason why the new parallel IFS system had to be in some way compatible with the Silicon 2 IFS system, so the integration could be smoother. Many aircraft from this time period would be retrofitted to use the new parallel IFF system, but this would be at a very stringent process. It would only be available for Soviet aircraft made after the 1970s and 1980s, unless it was up to the current Air Force standard. So, that means most single-engine aircraft of the fighter type did not see the installation of the unit unless it was a testing platform or were a heavily upgraded variant of that aircraft, that would see service or be put in reservist warehouses. Such variants that would be equipped with the parallel IFS system in the VVS and PVO units would be the MiG-23 MLD and MiG-21 BIS airframes, but from my research I've only been able to find a few examples of Soviet MiG-21s operating the parallel system, so they could have been disregarded more often. Of course, these aircraft by this time were already in the beginning phases of being removed from service and being given to other nations, such as for the case as 12 MiG-23 MLDs that were bought and given to Bulgaria. They would retain their installed parallel IFF systems and be allowed for use with the Bulgarian Air Force. In most cases, however, aircraft the VVS and PVO couldn't take back after the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself often occupied that nation, which in turn kept them. A notable example of this occurring was the Ukrainian Air Force and how they inherited 60-70 to Su-27s after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, most if not all operating parallel IFF systems. Coincidentally, this is how I got my Block 480i controller. Wink wink. Just like the Silicon 2 IFF system, Peril, also known as SRO 1P, Product 6201, the system's main purpose is to provide data to aligned forces that your aircraft is a friendly member to that nation. The other main ability of the Peril system was to encrypt its data it received and sent out. This data would be the IFF codes themselves present for the system when it received them and would transmit them. The aircraft's altitude, remaining fuel, and aircraft registration would be accessible to ground-based radar stations and aerial-based radar stations, also known as AWACS, with this form of IFF. One of the biggest features of the parallel IFF system was the ability, by use of the pilot, to send a distress signal in case of emergencies. Through this emergency distress, radar stations, be it on the ground or air, can see this and detect this and be able to find the pilot more easily to understand the situation and provide escort aircraft to that aircraft's location for assistance or for destruction in case of the possibility of it landing in enemy hands with, was present. The Peril IFS system would be able to operate multiple modes as well as operate in the 7 radar waveband range, which allow the system to have cryptographic coding and have image resistant codes. Basic technical data for operating the Peril IFS system. Pre-installed codes, 2, KD and KP. Switching of channels is done automatically or manually. If it is automatic, the system runs on a special clock that will then determine the point in time to switch the codes, but can most likely be off, depending on how fast the pilot flies. Code switching time, within 5 seconds. Operating mode. Pulse duration within 1 microsecond with the pulse's power being 3 kilowatts. Continuous operation for up to 20 hours. Electrical current required, 27 volts, 115 volts, and 400 hertz. System warm-up, within 2 minutes. Hours of reliability, 2,000 hours for every one failure. Peril weight, kilograms, within 30 kilograms. Before the pilot gets into their aircraft to fly, the pilot must receive a special report from the lead aircraft technician that worked on the aircraft's IFF system before the pilot's scheduled departure. 
Within this report, the lead technician describes what codes are installed in the auxiliary consoles of the SRO-1P and the SRZ-1P for that period of flying. This report will also give detail to the pilot when to manually switch the current code to the next one based on that day's schedule as well. The change in IFF codes and requester interrogation codes are put on these schedules to change so it can allow the parent air force to monitor the aircraft better and to ensure the system can't be tempered with as easily by jamming systems, if they could be jammed that is. Most cases when peril is being used with military aircraft, the SRZ-1P interrogator will be included in the IFF suite. The SRZ-1P is controlled by a rotary switch known as Block 5812 within the block that has options labeled as 1, 2, 3-1, and 3-2. The SRZ-1P, also known as the requester, as it interrogates other aircraft as objects. The system works automatically without input from the pilot but is required to be used manually when it is needed during the flight via the scheduled times for that day's flight. The SRZ-1P is turned on by using the OPS switch found in the cockpit. If the peril system is being used to interrogate and function with an aircraft operating the Silicon 2 or Silicon 2M system, a switch within the cockpit has to be put into the on position. This will then allow the interrogation system from the peril system to contact and function with the Silicon 2 system. The main controller for the SRO-1P portion of the peril system often varies from aircraft to aircraft. On most of the devices that are associated with controlling the system, multiple switches, including a rotary switch and a button, can be present. These all provide vital operations to the peril system that the pilot can control. Switches and Modes Spare Slave Switch The Spare Slave Switch is mainly intended for switching the SRO-1P and SRZ-1P systems from standard operation, in this case the slave mode, to spare mode, which is a form of backup for troubleshooting. 1-2 switch. This switch is locked in place by a metal bar preventing its position from changing. The 1-2 switch is responsible for setting the re-exposure of the control codes of the system to the W radar wave band, which is originally set to the third radar wave band in the 1 position. Disaster slash emergency switch. The disaster slash emergency switch is used when the pilot is experiencing problems with the aircraft and needs to communicate it to nearby ground and air based radar stations. By turning on the disaster slash emergency switch while on the third or seven radar wave band ranges, it will repeat its signal twice to activate the NRZP system's ability to see it as an emergency on its display screen for the controllers. Erase button. The erase button will connect the explosive cartridge circuit to the main power source, detonating the explosive cartridge present within the IFF system to ensure secrecy. This effect will also happen once a pressure switch detects 10 plus G's when the aircraft impacts the ground, detonating it. When the pilot ejects, it will also connect the explosive cartridge circuit. Rotary switch the rotary switch's main purpose is to switch the IFF code currently being used by the aircraft, which is done manually, by the pilot based on the schedule they are given to follow. The first position will put the system into automatic mode, also known as AUTH. This automatic mode will switch the IFF codes when programmed to do so, but the pilot still has to operate the system from time to time. The KD position is the first and often labeled as the current IFF code that the pilot will manually select, whereas the KP position is the subsequent code and used, which operates in the 7 radar waveband range. The final position, labeled as plus or minus 15, is meant to be used in between the KD and KP positions and will allow this current position's code to be valid for half an hour. KD and KP lights. The two lights that correspond with the KD and KP positions will turn on when that mode is being operated by the Peril IFF system. If the light is not on when in that mode, then there is a problem within the system. If the system can't be fixed while in the air, and the same error can happen on the 5812's lights, then the pilot will have to report to the flight director and act in accordance with their instructions. There also may be certain indicator lights within the cockpit that will turn on in the absence of the IFF system working, such as product 6201 could appear. The instructions given will often include turning systems off and back on and instructing the pilot to return to base if necessary. Technically speaking, there is more than one form of peril that is in use with similar company names in a number designation. 
These versions of Peril all function the same way, but are designed and made for different purposes. List of Peril Types Peril 1. Secret Identification Equipment CJSCP This form is capable of operating the 7th Raider Wave Band and is intended for image-resistant identification. Peril 2. Aircraft Responders and Requesters What the typical aircraft would have, aircraft are only paired with the SRZP as well. Peril 3. Ships, Responders, and Requesters Peril 4. Ground Radar Stations, Interrogators, paired with NRZ only. Peril 5. Vehicle-Based Responders, paired with NROP only. To clarify, the secret identification equipment is product 6110 and is uniform for all versions of Peril and is classified as the interrogator known as NRZ. The interrogator labeled as NRZP with the following product name of 6110 is designed to interrogate air or ground-based objects to identify if said air or ground-based object is a friendly member to the originating country or an enemy such unknown target. The NRZ system has many similar versions to it as well just like the Peril system for different applications like the NRZ 1P, NRZ 2P, NRZ 3P, and NRZ 4P. They all function the same in respect to their job, the only thing that changes about them is the transmitting device, aka the radar. NRZ-5P and NRZ-6P also exist, but are a little bit different but still mainly function the same way. These are all for ground-based radar stations and installations. For aircraft, they were only installed with the SRZ-P series, but much like the NRZ-P, still function the same and operate very similarly. The follow-up upgrade, SRO2P, product 6202, operated the SRZ-2P. The main tasks operated by the general form of NRZP and SRZP are as follow. Image-resistant identification of air and ground targets, non-impermeable identification of air and ground targets, individual identification of air and ground targets, and the principle of where are you and who are you. For units such as ground-based radar stations, their options about the aircraft are a bit more in-depth, receiving information pertaining to air targets for altitude and remaining fuel. This is only usable by ground-based radar stations operating Peril 4. Controlling identification of air and ground objects, determining an aircraft's position operating under distress mode. The detection zone of the NRZ and SRZ system is whatever the main system's target detection radar is installed with. For example, an AOX aircraft operating the Peril in an NRZ system can most likely see up to hundreds of kilometers away, whereas a MiG-23 MLD could only see 72 to 80 kilometers away. For those operating from an AWAC style of aircraft or a ground-based radar station, their form of NRZ will have four special modes for operating the interrogating unit. Mode 1, Limitation Resistant Identification. Mode 2, Image Resistant Identification, which is a guaranteed identification. This is done through Peril 1. Mode 3, Identification on the principle of where are you implemented in the 3rd and 7th radar wave band ranges. In Mode 4, Identification of the principles of where are you and who are you. In, in this mode, you can determine the air target's location or individual number, what the aircraft name is registered.
Depending on the aircraft and the size of its cockpit and the scope of its operation, it will have a chance to receive a few various types of controllers for different purposes. For predominantly Sequoia aircraft resulting in the SC-27 series of aircraft and its later variants, it used the WAC 480i control panel. For MiG aircraft, a different controller was often used that looked very similar to the older style of Block APK from the Silicon 2 system that is seen in many MiG aircraft examples. This controller is only missing the 1-2 position switch on the device itself and takes up the least amount of space possible compared to the other examples. However, to accommodate this change, there are more important systems required switches present within the aircraft's cockpit panels. These were most often installed on retrofitted MiG-23 MLDs and MiG-21 BISs, as well as put on the, at the time, newly made MiG-29 aircraft. Also widely unknown about the MiG-29, many export models only got the SRZ-02 from the Silicon 2 system. This can be seen when a MiG-29 is installed with the original Block 8BK from the Silicon 2 system directly. A country who got the export MiG-29A, 9.12A, was the Yugoslavian Air Force. However, Poland got both forms of the MiG-29As with and without the reduced IFF system capabilities. If the distress switch and erase button are not present on the control panel itself, then it will be its own separate control panel like the 1921 from the Silicon 2 system, functioning the same way except for having an extra switch for turning the system on. This is often included in the other control panels other than the Block 480i due to the fact that it is built into the control panel. Helicopters often had their own special type of parallel IFF control panel as well, which was more or less a restructured Block 480i with all the elements from the Block 480i rearranged in a different shape and with the deletion of the emergency and erase button from the main control panel. These were only present in helicopters and were in the MI-24 series of helicopters at the very least. Airliners and most likely any other large aircraft would operate the Block 482 control panel. This form of control panel is the largest one that was made and provides multiple IFF functions through two rotary switches. This is probably due to the fact that these larger types of aircraft often fly for a longer periods of time, requiring more valid and varied IFF codes depending on the flight schedule. This may sound lazy, but I won't discuss the extra items that operate the parallel unit. There isn't enough information that I can find slash understand other than just listing them off. Since I'm in a bit of a time crunch anyway, I won't go into detail about them, but most if not all are in the SC-27 SK manual, If so if you want to research them, that is your best source.